I would ask you please to turn in your Bibles to this twelfth chapter again of Acts. Knowing that probably this evening might be the last of the series of studies that we're doing in Acts, I came to chapter 12 and thought to myself, I wonder whether I should hop over this chapter and go to the next chapter which speaks about the thrusting out of the first missionaries from Antioch. And then I decided that that was probably a missionary bias and that that wasn't the way to do it. And that we really ought to come to this 12th chapter and to tackle the chapter as it stands. And as I began to look into this chapter, I suddenly realized that it is in fact a profoundly significant chapter and a very good place at which to draw these initial discussions and studies in the book of the Acts to a close. Because within this chapter we come up against what you might call almost a kind of almost final confrontation between the might and the power of the state and the hidden resources of the people of God on the eve of their beginning to reach out from Antioch to the uttermost parts of the earth. And you've got it there as you look in the early verses of chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. He had James put to death with the sword and then verse 5 and Peter was kept in prison. There is one side of the confrontation. And then verse 5 goes on and says, But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. But when I talk about the state here, there's something we need to understand because it is not the state of Rome that's being referred to. But it is the political nation of Israel in the person of one of its last kings, Herod Agrippa I. And I want us to look at this confrontation this evening simply under three headings. First of all, the basic conflict, what it was. Secondly, the fatal flaw, that which brought about the downfall of Herod. And then thirdly, the vital secret of the church's victory and triumph over the forces of evil. The basic conflict, the fatal flaw, and the vital secret. And first of all, we need to look at what was the nature and significance of this basic conflict that we find here in this chapter, played out between Herod and Peter. And I think in order to understand the significance of what that conflict was all about, we need to remind ourselves of what we were studying just a few weeks ago in our morning sessions in Exodus. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, last Sunday morning, you remember, we saw the infant nation of Israel standing, as it were, at the foot of Mount Sinai, redeemed by an act of God out of the bondage of Egypt. And at that point in chapter 19 of Exodus, God is about to declare to Israel his holy law. And yet before he does so, he teaches them something that is absolutely foundational to their understanding of their nature and character as the people of God. Because he says to them, although the whole earth is mine, although in a sense I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, all men everywhere on the face of this earth must bow to me. Although the whole earth is mine, you, Israel, will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel, I have chosen you to be my special people. I have chosen you to be my servants. I have chosen you to live under my rule. I am to be your king. And you are to show to the whole earth what it is like for a nation to have God as its king. Israel, you are not a democracy. Israel, you are not a monarchy with a human king. Israel, you are what we would call a theocracy. That is a nation whose king is 
is God. Now if that's so, who is this man called Herod Agrippa the first king of the Jews? What is a king doing in Israel in any case? Why is he there? And to get the answer to that, you have to go back to the book of Samuel. And in chapter 8 of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, you'll see Samuel weeping, as it were, as the people with total lack of tact and heartlessness say, you know, Samuel, you're a bit beyond it, judging us and leading us, being a prophet, and your children aren't doing very well. We want to have a king, like all these nations round about us in the world. We want to be like the world around us. We don't want to be this special kind of theocracy. Who's ever heard of a theocracy? We want a king like the nations round about us. And you discover there that Samuel is absolutely heartbroken. He feels that he's been rejected as the leader of the people. But God says to him, Samuel, you've got it all wrong. Samuel, it's not you they're rejecting. It's me. <coughs> They've rejected me as king. <coughs> I called Israel out of Egypt to be my holy nation. I called them to submit to my rule as king. I called them out of Egypt to show to the whole world what it would be like to live as a nation under the rule of God. And I chose them to be priests, that they might tell that to the world. In choosing a king, Samuel, they are rejecting me. And they chose their king. And this man about whom we read here in chapter 12, Herod, was one of the last figureheads of that political state of Israel. The Israel that had rejected the rule of God and substituted the rule of man. The nation which, as Campbell Morgan puts it in his very helpful commentary on Acts, the nation that had become, and it sounds like a contradiction of terms, a godless theocracy. And the basic conflict that you have here in this chapter 12 before the gospel can be released to go to all nations is the conflict between the new Israel of God, Christ chosen, and the old godless theocracy represented by Herod. Now you'll recall if you go back to the gospel of Matthew in chapter 16 which is just about the watershed of our Lord's popularity as Matthew tells the story there in his gospel, you'll be aware that Jesus spoke about this impending confrontation that was going to come. He turns around to his disciples and he said, Who do men say that I am? And after he's had various definitions given to him, he says, But who do you say that I am? And Peter comes back and says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in that confession... Jesus comes back and he says, Now, with your understanding of that, I will build my church, my people, my nation, my assembly is the word, those who have been called out to be my people. And the gates of hell, the powers of death, the forces of evil, shall not prevail against it. Now when Jesus said those words, I will build my assembly, my called out ones, my nation, my people. He was saying something that to Jewish ears had a profound significance. For what Jehovah had done by redeeming Israel out of the bondage of Egypt and by bringing Israel to himself to be his holy nation, that they might shed the light and bring news of his salvation to the ends of the earth, Jesus was going to do for all nations. Do you see what Jesus was saying about the significance of who he was? 
And when you go on through the gospel into the very next chapter, you'll see that Jesus is transfigured. His divine glory shines forth. And what is it that he discusses there with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration? Luke says he discussed, or they discussed, his exodus that he should accomplish at Jerusalem. His exodus, his mighty act of redemption where he would bring men and women out of the bondage and slavery of sin. Bring them to himself to be his holy nation, his kingdom on earth, where his will is done and his kingdom comes, and where his kingship is acknowledged. Jesus said of himself, my meat, the food that sustains me, that which keeps me going, that sustains my life, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. And then he turns to his disciples, he said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. Even as our Lord submitted to his Father, so he sent his disciples to submit to his Lordship. And his disciples got the message. And Peter puts it down there in his epistle and he says, Do you know, you Christians, you are a chosen nation. You Christians, you are a royal priesthood. You Christians, you are a people belonging to God. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In other words, those same words that were spoken to the Israel of God, taken out of Egypt, are repeated to you and to me. We are to be a theocracy. We are to submit to God's rule. And Christ's primary goals are to so build his church, and so build up his people, and cause his people to enthrone Christ in their hearts as Lord. To be made more like Christ in their lives. And to proclaim that Christ as Lord to the nations. And all that Israel had failed to be as God's servant, Christ was as the perfect servant. And Christ calls us to be as his church. And the basic conflict that you see here in this chapter 12 is between that which had failed the old order and that which had been raised to newness of life through the death and resurrection of Jesus as he called out his people. It's a clash between the old and the new. It's a clash between nominalism and reality. A clash between death and life. A clash between Israel as the barren fig tree and the new Israel of God as the living vine drawing its life from Christ and producing the fruit of the Spirit. It is the clash between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom where Christ's authority has been usurped. And what you see here in this clash between Herod and the church is a conflict in a sense manifest in space and time of that ultimate conflict that was there before these worlds were ever founded. When Lucifer, son of the dawn, said, I will aspire to the throne of the Most High, where he wanted himself to be God, to usurp the rule of God. Because of the pride of his black heart. And you see it spelled out here. And it brings us to the second thing that we want to look at this evening. Because it was that pride that was the fatal flaw in Herod's heart. The basic conflict was between a godless theocracy and the people of God. The fatal flaw was that pride, the pride of Lucifer, son of the dawn, that was in the heart of that man who sat on the throne of the nation of Israel. Fatal because when men with pride rise up against the kingship of God and his authority, and when men set themselves against his rule, ultimately they want to usurp his throne. And fatal, 
Because as the psalmist said in Psalm 2, all those who set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed, he will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Just look at those first three verses and look at Herod's intention and motivation. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Now I think it's clear as you look through those verses that his first intention was religious. And so often dead religion and persecution have been allies. And Herod was a man who had religious scruples. But his subsequent motivation was political. When he saw the response of the Jews, when as he killed James he heard favorable noises from his Jewish subjects, because there was a fatal sinful flaw in that man's makeup, because there was pride in his heart, it went straight to his head. They liked what I did to James. Hmm, here's a way to gain prestige. Here's a way to be popular. Here's a way to establish my throne. What may not be immediately apparent was that that man really needed to establish his throne. And for various reasons, when you look into the history books, you'll discover that the Herod who married, murdered John the Baptist was actually exiled. That's Herod Antipas. And when he was exiled, part of his dominion came to this Herod about which we're reading. And then in the year 41, both Judea and Samaria were added on to his kingdom. So here was a king whose kingdom was expanding. You will realize that there were other tetrarchies in that land because it was all under Roman rule. And then there was another reason why he needed to get his throne in place. This man actually had been brought up evidently for 30 years in the lap of luxury and indulgence in the city of Rome. And he was a man whose lifestyle was degenerate. And I'm quite sure he was afraid lest his cultural background and his upbringing in those Roman and Greek cultural influences might bring censure from the Jews. And so outwardly, according to Josephus, before the Jews, he was a man who was impeccably religious. He made sure that he went through all the motions of religion. He attended every religious ceremony. He kept all the sacrifices. He wanted to be established and acclaimed as a protagonist of Jewish values. His throne depended on it. But you see, it was a sheer hypocrisy. Because his goal was not to establish the theocracy with God's rule, but his goal was to establish his own rule, and his ambition was that at the name of Herod, every knee should bow. And when you turn to the end of the chapter in verse 23, you can see just how clearly that shows through. Because it says there, when people praised him, he did not give God the glory. Here he is, coming to this place in Caesarea. There's been a bit of a problem there, there's been a quarrel. And these people are coming around trying to suck up to him and butter him up. And they come around him and they start praising him. There he is, sat on his throne. Can't you imagine this man who for 30 years lived in Rome? How many times he must have gone down to the Colosseum? How many times he must have seen the proud Caesars of Rome going up into the royal box and hear the homage and the shouts and the cries of their pagan subjects? And I wonder how many times this man Herod had imagined himself right there on the center stage as the object of the worship and the cries of the crowd. And when in Caesarea his little kingdom, garbed in all his royal regalia like some pathetic figure from a comic opera, all these wheedling people trying to get their own way, 
bow and scrape before him. This ignorant man laps it all up. And when they cry out, My, this is the voice of a God, not a man. I believe that that was music to his ears. He accepts their homage. He bathes in the glory they give to him. And despite his Jewish scruples, he allows the diabolical truth of his black heart to emerge. He accepts the tribute. This man is a God. How do you see how that is a reenactment of that ultimate rebellion of Lucifer, son of the dawn, who said in his heart, I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne above the throne of God, I will make myself like the Most High. For we are made in the image of God as men and women. And we cannot live without God. And either we will bow to God's rule, or in rebellion we will make ourselves into gods. Because that is the fatal flaw. That is the pride that is in our hearts. That is what sin has done to us. It has caused us to rebel. And by nature, we do not want God to rule over us, nor do we want Him to have the glory. And our natural desire and our natural instinct is to receive that glory and adulation of the crowd to ourselves. We want to be in the center of the stage. And that is a fatal flaw. As the psalmist said, why do the nations rage? Why do the nations plot in vain? Why do they conspire? Why do they take their stand and gather together against the Lord and His anointed in rebellion? Why do they say, let's break off the chains? Why do they say, let's throw off the fetters? Let's do away with the divine rule? Why do they do it? Because ultimately there will not be any one of us that will ever succeed in that rebellion against God. For the Lord, says the psalmist, who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. For he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, In Zion, my holy hill, I have set my king. And no man ultimately will have any other alternative but to bow to that king on Zion's holy hill. <coughs> and at the end of this story, in very graphic terms, it literally took just a handful of worms to tumble this proud fool from the throne of his own self-importance and cause him, not willingly, but definitely, to bow the knee. Pride of man and earthly glory, sword and crown, betray his trust. What with care and toil he buildeth, tower and temple fall to dust. And before the church of God and before the rule of Christ, before the king that God has set his anointed on Zion, his holy hill, that man tumbles. Not because of his own will, but because of a lowly worm and God smiting him. You know, there's a very serious question that each one of us needs to answer tonight. Who occupies the throne of my heart? If I should be called tonight to appear before the throne of God, how would I stand? 
Because one day, all of us will bow. There's no doubt about that. And tonight God gives us that possibility of bowing at his feet and acknowledging him to be our King and our Lord. And to take that throne in our hearts which is his and his by right. And to have the absolute control of our lives. And the question is, are you going to bow to him as King and Lord? Are you going to submit to his word? Are you going to take him as your Savior or your Lord? Or will you carry that conflict and that fatal flaw and that rebellion to the grave? Will it have to be like Herod that you will be struck down before you will bow down? What an epitaph to have inscribed on your tombstone. He did not give the glory to God. The Lord struck him down. And he was eaten by worms. The basic conflict, the fatal flaw, and then finally the vital secret. Because I want us to look now at the victory of God's people over the godless pride of man. And I want to suggest briefly that there are three elements which constitute the vital secret of their victory. First of all, the will of God. Secondly, the people of God themselves and their prayers. And then thirdly, the angels of God and their ministry. First then, the will of God. Jesus said, I will build my church. That is the divine will. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The powers of death, the minions of Lucifer, those who aspire to usurp my rule, ultimately will have to bow. And it is that for which we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we mean those people of God who acknowledge his kingship. That is the kingdom of God. It's not geographical. It's not political. It is not social. It is in the hearts of men and women who say, I will submit to God as my Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And at the last, all the kingdoms of this world will bow and become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And that includes the kingdom of your heart and mine. For God will ensure that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, just as the waters cover the sea. And nothing is more certain than that will of God. When you and I pray, we are praying that that will may be accomplished. We need to understand our salvation in terms of what God's purpose is. He has saved us that we might be a people of His, submitted to His will. He hasn't saved us primarily to make us happy or to solve all our psychological problems. Praise God when He is first and His rule is first in our lives, there is joy, there is happiness, there is the fruit of the Spirit. But that isn't what comes first. We are saved to be His servants. We are saved to acknowledge Him as Lord. And His will is that His kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. But you know, it's a presumption to say that we understand how that will may be worked out in detail. And I think you and I always need to be very cautious when somebody comes up to us and says, I think I know what the will of God for your life is. I think you have a very clear example of that in this chapter. Why was James killed but Peter spared? What was God doing? Didn't God answer prayer for James? Why did Peter get away? That's a very real question, isn't it? Why do I have to suffer what I feel I have to suffer when I see somebody else who does And the simple answer is, God hasn't explained why. 
His will, we know, is to establish his kingdom, his rule in our hearts. That's unaltered. The fact that in this story God did release Peter in this miraculous way is the evidence that he is in control and that he could have done exactly the same thing for James if that had been in line with what he was trying to accomplish. And you might say that Peter's deliverance at least sheds light and understanding on James' execution. And yet for some reason his eternal purposes were better served by taking James to himself than by allowing James to live. When you think about it, that wasn't quite the problem for James that it is for you and I when we come and try and understand it. You and me, sorry. Because within milliseconds of the cold steel severing his neck, James understood. When you and I pray that God's will may be done, it's not to batter God into submission to our will. It is to commune with him about his will. We're praying your will be done, your kingdom come. Whether it is by life or by death, whether it is by health or by sickness, whether it is by wealth or by poverty. Do you remember, incidentally, who James and John were? Remember that little story in Mark 10? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. What incredible chic. Yet sometimes when you hear people pray, you wonder if they don't pray in the same way. God, you've got to do this. Jesus graciously turns around to them and he says, Mark 10, 36, What do you want me to do for you? He didn't clobber them. Verse 37, they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Is that not evidence that the fatal flaw was even there in James and John? And Jesus said, verse 38, you do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Or oh, we can, they answered. Colossal ignorance. Jesus said, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized, and that is the cup of suffering, and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. You will drink that cup. And what you see here in chapter 12 is that the very first apostle to be baptized into the sufferings of Christ was James. But do you also know that the very last apostle to die was John? Living, dying, is not the lesson here that whether our life be short, whether it be long, whether it be the way we would want to have it or in some other case, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And whether life is short or whether it is long, whether it is free of suffering or full of suffering, we are all baptized into the fellowship of his sufferings. The will of God. Secondly, the people of God, quickly. And their weapons. I think the lessons that we have heard many a time from this chapter on prayer are so well known. Verse 5, it says, Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That word earnestly there means it was intense, agonizing prayer. Unceasing, sincere, ardent, and serious. So their prayers were earnest. 
But there's something else, isn't there, about their prayers in this story? You know, these Christians in the first century, they weren't supermen. They were just like us. And their prayers were actually full of doubts. That's what I like about the Word of God. It doesn't gloss them over and say, well, they had this marvelous victory in prayer. Look at verse 14 again. She recognized Peter's voice, overjoyed, ran back without opening it and said, Peter's at the door. And what did they say? You're out of your mind. That wasn't a very Christian response to this dear young lady who came back with a testimony that God had answered prayer. You're out of your mind, they said. And when she kept on insisting, they said, well, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. In other words, they were full of doubts when they prayed. They didn't think their prayers were any good. Do you ever feel like that? I don't know how many times in the Far East, in the Javanese church, people would come up to me and they'd say, would you pray about so-and-so? And I would say to them, but have you prayed about it? And they say, oh, well, your prayers are so much better than ours. I think it had to do with perhaps the fact that they must have thought that the skin had something to do. I don't know what it was. But you see, that's just not true. Elijah was a man of the same kind of temperament, the Scripture says, that we had. He was just like us, but he prayed. He wasn't a super saint, and God answered. You see, it's not the perfection nor even the strength of our conviction in prayer. We're not exercising some psychokinetic force that pressures God into doing something. The efficacy of our prayers and the reason why they work is because of the one to whom they are directed. And the one who bids us to pray, your will be done, your kingdom come. And as we were thinking the other week, it wasn't the raised arms of Moses in themselves that brought Israel the victory over Amalek. It was because Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And that is why, and only why, prayer is God's effective weapon. It is because the one to whom our hearts and our heads and our wills and our cries are directed in prayer is committed to the victory of his will and the establishment of his kingship. And he has ordained that we should pray. There is that vital secret weapon. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty how? Through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's why you'll be there next Wednesday evening at the house group praying. And the Wednesdays that follow, that's why you'll be there because God will only bless us in this church if we are raising our hands to Him and seeking that the blessing come down upon for we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. The weapons of that warfare are spiritual. We ignore them. And you may fill this church, but will be to no effect in our lives. Finally, the angels of God, for it was an angel that struck proud Herod from his throne. It was an angel that brought Peter through the gates of the prison. Doesn't it all have the ring of a sort of first-person article in the Reader's Digest? You can imagine Peter almost sitting down and writing it. I didn't quite know what was going on. In fact, I really wasn't sure at all. Then suddenly I realized it was an angel. Just how it dawned on him. Maybe he was a heavy sleeper. I think probably he was. Some good people are. <clears throat> But God has his ministering angels and his servants and he sends them at those moments of crisis. Do you remember poor old Jacob trembling at the thought? Here he was with his tiny little caravan, his family, well not so tiny, but it was unprotected. And he comes to the, the verge of meeting up with Esau, whom he thinks is coming to him with all fury and rage, and he's terrified. And then the Bible says, but the angels of God met him. And he called that place Mahanaim, two companies because he realized that God was there with him. 
You remember that story so beloved by our minister when the armies of Aram came in anger and surrounded Elisha. And Elisha's servant cries out in fear and he says, Oh, alas, my master, what shall we do? And the old prophet says, Now come on, don't panic. There are more with us than there are with them. And the servant must have thought the old boy was off his rocker. But Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open the young man's eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And he looked and he saw and the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 34, The angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him. And he delivers them. Blessed, he says, is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints. That is, reverence him as king in your hearts. In every situation. For those who fear him will lack nothing. When you come to the end of the story of Herod the Bible says and all that he stands for the Lord struck him down and then verse 24 but the word of the Lord continued to increase and to spread and verse 25 when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission they returned from Jerusalem taking with them John also called Mark after the mighty pomp of the dead nation of Israel had fallen and been eaten by worms, three tiny solitary figures trot out of the city of Jerusalem, heading along that road to Antioch, 300 miles to the north. And you'll discover at this point in the story of Acts, Jerusalem and the church there virtually, apart from one council, fades out of the picture. And it's that city to which those three solitary figures are moving, Antioch, that now becomes the new center of operations. Almost like some space station out there in space, a new base for exploration. And here it is, Antioch, a new city. A new city to send out the gospel into all the world and to all nations. To proclaim the news that God is King. And that his great purpose in saving this world is to make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. And his great commission that he has given to us is that we might be a light to the Gentiles. And carry the news of his salvation to the ends of the earth. Said Jesus, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations I wonder in what way we are responding to that authority